I'm Andrew Dunstan. I work for the second quadrant, and we're going to talk today about how you can run your own uh, instances of the farm service, test your own packets, and do some other uh, useful and interesting stuff. Um, obligatory uh, plug for my employer. We're hiring. If you're interested, please come and see one of us. Um, so I'm going to review a little bit of the history. Um, in 2004, round about, uh, which is a little bit after I became involved with uh, Postgres, a year, 18 months, um, we had a series of incidents in which um, changes that had been made in the code uh, affected uh, platforms that we didn't usually test on or configurations that we didn't usually test with. Um, and we found out about it a long time after those changes had been made. And, um, you know, we were, we were just lucky that various people were running these tests, but it was a very haphazard thing. I think there was one case where we didn't find out and, until we were pretty close to, the, to, to beta and we had to make some adjustments. That was generally agreed to be a fairly unsatisfactory case uh, as a situation. And so uh, I decided to do something about it. And um, at the time, there really weren't any uh, good solutions to this. There are some, uh, there are a lot more uh, useful solutions, fairly generic, but, but still very useful. But at the time, there was nothing. Um, the Samba project had uh, Build Farm, and I sort of took my uh, inspiration for this project s very loosely from the Samba project, but it was pretty much the only thing in the open source world uh, that was around. And so pretty much I created this thing out of, uh, 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 from scratch. Um, pretty, here's pretty much the architecture. Um, we have a source code repository. Um, we have a series of, um, of uh, machines or, or virtual machines or uh, uh, configurations spread out across the network from volunteers. Um, essentially, they will pull code from the source code repository. It's much easier now with Git than it was in the old days with CVS when you had to use things like CVS up and stuff. That was fairly ugly. But uh, uh, nowadays, you can just do a, a simple git pull. Um, and then it will run some tests, make sure we can compile, can test a bunch of different things. And at the end of that, it, uh, each one will upload results to a, uh, a server. Uh, and the server has a web interface. Uh, which, which you can look at. Uh, it now also features uh, an RSS feed so that you can, uh, you can get updates uh, in your news feed and so on. Um, that's basically the architecture. So uh, in, uh, we members or animals because we adopted a convention of naming these, these um, these instances uh, after various animals. Um, each member performs a run or a build, um, and each run consists of a number of stages. So the stage could be configure, the next one's going to be make, and it does this in a, uh, uh, in a serial fashion until either it gets a failure, it stops on the first failure, and um, uh, or it gets to the end, in which case it reports a success. Uh, it's quite common to run more than one on a single machine uh, for different configurations. I have, for instance, uh, a Windows machine that has uh, three animals on it. One runs with Sigwin, another one runs with uh, Microsoft compiler, another one runs with the MSYS compiler. Um, uh, I have another animal that runs on, on BSD. It runs, one runs a standard configuration, another one runs with uh, uh, clobber cache always set. Um, so that's quite a common uh, setup. 
We have a lot of reports in the server. Um, there are currently 119 animals reporting. Uh, they're reporting on six branches, our five stable branches, uh, plus, the, plus the head. Head is our, what we call master. Uh, it's a, that's a relic from the CVS days. Um, in the last 90 days, as of the time I wrote this slide, there were 55,000 builds reported, uh, which is quite a lot. Um, as it was one, one case, uh, one machine that had actually done 571 builds just on the master branch. We have about 600 gigabytes of, of data on that server. It's getting pretty full, Stephen, yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> and, and we have an archive server which has a whole lot more data, uh, so that going back historically, but we, we purged the production machine to keep it, keep it manageable. Uh, the history actually goes back to 2004. There are some builds in there for release 7.2. So it's, all that history is there and available and various people have access to the, the archive to do research. And if they really wanted to, they could do research going back a very long way. Right. So, a lot, lot of stuff there. Um, security of the system. Um, it was uh, one of the things that we wanted was not to have a system where anything had outside had to trigger a build. So th you can put one of these uh, one of these uh, instances behind a firewall. Uh, everything uh, is only everything is done by outbound connection. So it connects to the server grabs the source code, it makes a decision locally about whether it wants to run, uh, run a build. Essentially, what it decides on, that on is, has there been a change on this branch? Uh, that's the basic criterion. And then it runs it, and then it pushes the result out to, to the server. So there is, uh, and we have support for HTTP proxies. So essentially, uh, there is nothing, uh, this is run in a reasonably secure uh, uh, way. In terms, oops, in terms of integrity, um, each, each instance has a shared secret with the server and uh, every report is signed uh, uh, using that secret. Uh, uh, essentially, it's done with an SHA-1 uh, hash. We're gonna, I'm going to change that to SHA-256 uh, at some stage fairly soon. It doesn't really matter that much because for this purpose, it, SHA-1 is, is sufficient. But um, people just uh, uh, get antsy about it, so I'm going to change it. Um, the client code can be downloaded from Git. Now, to run what I'm talking about today, you would actually need the code from Git because I had to make some changes the other day that I hadn't uh, anticipated. Uh, that will be in the next release. But if you want to do that in the next few weeks, you would need to, to use the code from Git. It's all Perl code, 100% Perl. The config file is also Perl. Uh, so you basically create a config file by copying the sample file that is in the Git repository uh, to some file you, you name. There are two main scripts uh, in the suite. The first one's called run build, that's the older one. It performs a single run. And then there's this, this uh, wrapper uh, called run branches.pl, which uh, uh, essentially uh, has three modes. Um, probably the most important one is the run all, which basically uh, will run every branch that it can, one after the other. Um, so it more or less looks like this, a, a run. There should be double dashes that my this software has unfortunately decided to elide those. Um, <coughs> And the thing that governs which branch it's going to run is this, is this uh, setting in the global section of the, of, the, uh, of the config file, this setting called branches to build. Now, it can, be, it can have a number of different types of value. Um, the standard one, I think it's the default, is simply this scalar value all, which says, uh, and if it's a scalar value, then essentially what it does is it goes out to the server 
it collects this file branches of interest.txt and then it will run either all for all of them or there are a few other uh, meta values that it can you can have for instance you can you might decide you only want to run the latest three stable branches so you would run this head plus latest three uh, there are a few other uh, settings uh, I think it's head plus latest n or all of there are basically the, the the values you can have so um, that's how things were up until release 10. Um, st starting at release 10, there's an extra uh, facility. The first thing is that we, I made some changes to allow branch names to be um, uh, multi-level, in, in other words, to have a slash in them, in effect. Um, so uh, you can, it's possible to have branches uh, like, you know, with names like dev slash feature, blah, blah, or, or what have you, like, like these examples. The other change I made was that instead of having a scalar or a list of actual named branches, you can have a regular expression. Um, QR is Perl's way of saying what's inside the brackets is a regular expression. Um, so you can say... Uh, you, we want to match any branch that's got a prefix starting with dev. Um, now, what it does in that case is it doesn't go out and get the uh, the uh, branches of interest of text. Instead, what it does is it it checks out the master branch of the uh, of the repository that you're using, and gets a list of branches, and then it it uh, works out which ones of those will match the regular expression. Um, so as long as your branch is in your repository, because this is designed to use with your repository, not the, the Postgres community repository, as long as the branches in your repository that you want tested match this regular expression, you'll be able to run against all, any of those branches. So, it's, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's a possibility. I haven't really. Uh, we could uh, we, we could think about that, but uh, uh, I'd have to work out how to do that. Right. Yeah. Uh, Yes, I mean, it might be possible to do that and then we'd have to have sort of a negative filter or something like that. But, yeah, that might be possible. Anyway, it's, it, this is basically designed to use with your repository rather than the community repository. Uh, and, of course, you would have to change the uh, SCM repo value in the config file to point to your repository rather than the, uh, than the, uh, the community repository. Uh, so you would basically need a convention, in, at least with this setup, in order to... So my, norm, my suggestion is that you use something like a prefix, then possibly a branch name if you're doing back patches, and something else, like it could be, you know, dev slash my feature. We assume you're not back patching that, but if it's a bug, then you might have... Uh, to, you might put a, a branch name. At any rate, it's up to you to decide what convention you're going to use... Um, I'm not enforcing this on you, but this is, these are the sorts of conventions that I would probably use. Um, the other thing to note, just uh, in passing, because we're going to see it later on, is that um, in, the, in the Git repo, runbranches.pl can also take a list of positional arguments, uh, which are branches, and uh, that actually overrides the setting in the config file. So if you want to run, use call run branches and build two or three particular branches that you name, you can put those as positional arguments on the command line. And that's a, that's a, an enhancement that I just found useful, you know, when I was working on this recently. So uh, now turning aside a bit, uh, to, 
a bit more history. Last year, we were talking about upgrading the build farm server, and Dave said, well, how do we know we, we can up, upgrade the build farm server? And we said, well, we don't. He said, well, where's your test server? And I said, well, we haven't actually got one. Um, so, um, and we didn't really actually have a recipe. I mean, we, the server had grown kind of like topsy over the years, and it was a bit of a, a, bit of a mishmash, and we managed to move the server from uh, a few years back, it used to run on a server at command prompt, and we moved it on to the, the community repo, but that actually, that wasn't a completely friction <laughs> uh, uh, exercise. We had a few, few glitches along the way. Um, so basically, I decided to uh, create a recipe for setting up a test server. And, uh, the recipe I've created is essentially uh, a, a, a vagrant recipe. Uh, it, uh, the one that's in the repo is, uh, 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 is set up uh, to run with VirtualBox, but I'll run it actually on an, uh, with Amazon as well. Um, it, can, it will run with Debian Stretch, which is what we use on, our, on the production server. It also runs with Ubuntu Bionic and um, when Red Hat 8 comes out, I'll probably add a, add, add a CentOS variant for it. Um, so setting up a test server is pretty simple. You can you clone this repository uh, here. These slides, by the way, I'll make available uh, as soon as this is, this is over. And um, it, then you can, if you're using uh, Vagrant, you can simply run Vagrant up and it will, will set up the test server for you. Uh, if you're actually, or you could simply clone it onto the host you want to run on and then just run the provision script and that works perfectly well. So the server application is also Perl. I, I've been doing Perl for a long time. Um, so it's kind of what I'm uh, reasonably uh, at, at home with. Um, it's it's very old-fashioned application. It's a set of CGI scripts. Um, and um, uses Postgres, of course, for, for uh, storage. And the presentation layer is done using Perl's template toolkit. Um, the application is really kind of, kind of a dinosaur and probably needs to be written, rewritten using something, you know, either, you know, uh, if I wanted to be re more radical, I would do it, redo it in Django, but, or, or possibly uh, in, Majolicious, which is the uh, Perl uh, web app framework. Um, but it is what it is for now, and, um, and it works. The, re the URLs are rather ugly, though. Okay, one of the things that we wa I wanted to do when I, uh, was I, when I created this recipe was I said, well, how am I to populate it? Uh, and populate it in a way that is reasonably representative of what we've got on the server. And so I created this, uh, this thing. It runs once a day on the server that takes an extract from the database. Um, the extract is pretty much like what we've, what we've got in the production database. Uh, the different personal data is, is, uh, is filtered out, so there are no, no owner names, no owner emails. Uh, all the secret data is is uh, is uh, is gone, um, and the three large tables. These three large tables uh, are restricted. So the table build state. I'm going to do a quick tour through the schema in, in a minute. But these the build status log is the largest table, and the only stuff we've got in there is for stuff from. One animal, Prion, uh, it's a machine that runs um, Amazon Linux. Um, we only take it for the head branch on the latest build. So we've got literally the log from one build here. Build status recent 500 is, is uh, a sort of cache of, of recent uh, build metadata and we only take 90 days worth of that. And uh, build status itself is, we've got data for every value that's actually on the dashboard. So if you click something on the dashboard, you'll actually get a, in, and the sample data is loaded, you'll actually get a result. 
Um, if you're running your own server, then you can comment that out in the provision script. It's only a few lines uh, right at the bottom. Or the sample data tar file also contains an unload script that will, will remove all the sample data. <coughs> um, but I've found that useful, and we're gonna, I'm going to show you in a minute what it looks like. There are some things that we do on the production server that the test server won't do. It's not set up uh, to do HTTPS. That's something you'll have to arrange for yourself. Um, if you were running this on your intranet, then it probably wouldn't matter that much. Um, and uh, you know, but if you were running it on a, you know, somewhere out on the cloud, then you might want to have, have HTTPS set up. Um, it doesn't really matter from the point of view of uploading results because the results have to be signed anyway. Um, so you, HTTPS isn't really going to add any great amount of security to you. Uh, on the other hand, if you wanted to restrict access to the server, uh, as we're going to do in one instance, uh, uh, then you probably are going to want HTTPS. It doesn't do email alerts and notifications, so uh, um, again, that's something you would need to arrange for yourself. Uh, it currently, our registration page is protected from garbage by using uh, Google, Google's capture gadget. We're not doing that on the test server. We've turned off uh, reporting whether Branches that come in are actually in branches of interest.txt. If you're running with a regular expression branches of interest on your client, then you don't don't want the server checking that. So we've turned I've turned that off. So registering clients, you would register in pretty much the same way uh, as you would on the production server. You connect to the web application and fill in some data, I'm going to do that in the demo in a minute if we have time. And uh, then you connect to the server using uh, you know, Vagrant SSH or what have, whatever. Uh, you become the build, PG Build Farm user to the database. And this is what our admins do. It's a really, uh, manual process. Um, we don't, there isn't, the web app doesn't have an approval process built in. So just the approval requires logging into the server. This happens so infrequently that it's not worth building a web app for. Um, so select star from pending will show you what the pending applications are. The, the applications will come through with a name, uh, uh, which is just a bunch of uh, short uh, hex string. Uh, to approve it, you select approve, you put the old name, the hex string, and the new name according to whatever your convention is. Uh, and the result is going to show you the owner's name and email and the shared secret. You're going to need that shared secret to put into your config file uh, if you're, uh, or to hand to whoever um, is going to run the, uh, the instance for you. So you email it or communicate it somehow or other, carry a pigeon or whatever. Um, so, you're going to need to choose a naming scheme for your server. Don't use animals. We've pretty much exhausted the list there, but, it, you know, it, it, um, it would make for confusion. So, you're going to need to choose some list, you know, choose, you know, um, uh, Latin names from the Vulgate was one that I found the other day. There's a list that can easily be found that has 236 entries, which should be more than you would need in any reasonable lifetime. Um, or, you know, you could choose, you know, French baby names or something or other. Uh, actually, French is probably not a good, such a good thing. Best to choose something that doesn't use accents, doesn't use spaces, so sort of more or less ASCII names, if possible. Um, that's why I chose Latin names, because they're, they're going to be ASCII. Um, you can't really use host names because you can have multiple members on a host, which is... Uh, why I decided to have these sort of uh, virtual names. Um, if you want some inspiration, you can have a look at RSC 2100, which is all about using names, um, a la T.S. Eliot. 
So the database schema looks like this. It's very generic. There's nothing here about Postgres or stages or, you know, wh whatever. It's, it, um, it's a whole, uh, schema which could be adapted to a, a whole variety of things. There are some pluses and minuses to that. Um, it takes a bit of getting used to, as I'm sure Tom can attest. Uh, but on the other hand, it's it's uh, it's reasonably navigable. I'm going to do. I'm going to tell you about each of these ten, ten tables in a fairly short uh, tour. Okay, build systems. There's one of those per instance. So it's got the name, the owner information, the secret, uh, and the status among other things. So the, the status, in order for it to be active, has to be approved. It's normally the only table you would need to update in the system. Um, personality contains updates to the personality. So if you say, if you tell, tell us, there's a script to tell us that you've changed your compiler, that goes in here. We don't overwrite what's in build systems. We actually add an extra entry here. So we know uh, which personality goes with which build historically. Build status, there's one row per build. It's the second largest table. Um, it tells us what stage you failed at and that sort of stuff. Um, and if there was a failure, it contains the log of that, of that failure. Build status log is by far the largest table because it contains the, the log for every single stage, whether or not there was a failure. Um, and this is the one that uh, people like Tom need to do uh, research on for the most part. It's it's got it badly needs to be partitioned, which is one of the reasons we want to get to Postgres 11. I think what 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 version are we on now, Stephen? Nine four? Are we on nine four or nine? Six? Yeah. So we we badly need to move to to 11 so we can uh, we can partition this table. That's that's uh, that's uh, an important goal. And. I hope we can achieve that in the next month or no, a few months at least. Yeah. Yeah, we're running out of space. Yes. <laughs> right. Right. Um, build status recent 500 is is an extract from build status that's maintained by Trigger. Uh, it speeds up a bunch of queries. Uh, it's periodically purged by a cron job. Uh, dashboard mat is an old. <laughs> Is a homegrown materialized view because this app was created when we didn't have materialized views, uh, and it's what is used to drive the dashboard page. Uh, uh, if then loading the dashboard would be very painful indeed. Um, these are refreshed every time something comes in that might change them. Uh, later snapshot is uh, something uh, we just maintain one row per member per branch, so it's a very small table maintained by Trigger. And dashboard last modified is used to set the cache headers for the uh, for the dashboard page. Um, alerts is used to send out uh, email alerts about missing builds. This functions functionality is disabled on the test server. So I'm not going to say anything more about that. So, do you use your own repo on the on the uh, on your test server? Basically, you would no, need to to uh, change to uh, this directory slash home slash pgb local. Uh, remove the Postgres git because it it will be the one from the community and clone your own repository into here. This helps to set up git references in the status pages. That's what that's used for, and there, there's a cron job that runs that that will regularly pull every few minutes from that repo. Uh, setting up the client in the config file, you're going to need to point the SCM repo to the right Git repo. You're going to need to point the target to your new build farm server, and you're going to need to set of interest to some regular expression. Uh, a couple of other good things I like to do are to turn off Git keep mirror. Uh, that's kind of uh, out of date these days. I probably should default it off these days. And I like to use vPath builds because it just keeps things cleaner. So uh, once you've done that, you can uh, check that everything is okay. Um, 
we're going to you do that by uh, uh, running something like this. Um, now, I, you remember I mentioned that positional parameters here uh, uh, are branches. And the other thing here I'm going to do, I'm, instead of running every step, I'm just going to run a couple of steps like configure, make, and check, just to check that everything is, is working fine. This dash test, dash dash test says don't upload the results to the server. So this is basically just running, running a quick test to make sure that the client is configured correctly. Then you would register the new animal, go to the new website, run the approval process, add the credentials to your config file, and then run for real. Okay, so I'm going to run a demo. I, if anybody wants to play along, there's a uh, um, uh, couple of URLs there, so I'll leave the slide up for just a second. Um, yeah, we've got enough time. Um, so essentially, uh, uh, what I've got is I've got a couple of uh, Amazon instances we're going to run. Uh, uh, I'm going to run the commits to my local to my repository from this local machine here. Uh, then we'll run the build farm client on one Amazon instance, and um, we've got the server running on another instance. So. Let me escape from there and bring up. No, that's not the one I want. Okay, so this one is is um, this is actually. Uh, um, one where I've set up the, uh, the server with the data, f uh, with the sample data, and so you'll notice here I can click on on this, and uh, I will still see some some data that will show um, pretty much all everything that you would expect to see here on the production server. Um, if I click here, it's going to show me some history data. If I go back, if I click on one of these log stages, like for instance, check PG upgrade here, it's going to say I haven't got any data because we're, 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 not, uh, we're not keeping that data in the sample set. If I go down and I find uh, Prion somewhere, there we are. Okay, so now you'll notice that this one's got uh, times against all the, uh, uh, the stages, and if I if I select one, let's say uh, uh, PG control data check, and we've got data here that's running the tap test for PG control data. So for Prion on master, we can see everything, uh, but for the other branches, we we can't. But for the most part, this work this is fairly functional uh, in terms of of testing out the application testing out the database, that sort of stuff. So this is a reasonably good test. Um, so the other thing I've got here, now I've got a, um, um, I've got, you'll notice I've only got one uh, animal here. Um, it's called, called Rocky uh, and um, it's running uh, Ubuntu and it's only, it, it did a build a few days ago. Um, I think I've only got one build in there. Yeah. Um, so what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to, the first thing I'm going to do is, uh, here's, here's the repo. And you'll see that I've got a branch called, that's where dev my feature comes from. So I'm going to say, Git branch dev slash 
my feature two. Um, and then I'm going to push that up, get push pg dash demo. Helps if you can type. Okay. So now over here, I'm connected to the Take out force. So now it's actually checking out the. It's just that it doesn't have any changes on dev my feature one because I haven't pushed any changes, but it's suddenly detected dev my feature two. So this will actually take a few minutes because it's a new branch. Um, but it's essentially um, the server didn't have to know anything about this this branch, and uh, this will will simply be pushed up to the server when we're done this branch. The other thing you can do is you can actually remove branches, and it will detect that the branch is removed, and it will not will will basically ignore it then. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So um, the the build farm client is completely is is uh, modular, and uh, in fact the code includes uh, some um, some examples. So uh, let me uh, find that over here for you. Well, you, you you probably wouldn't do that inside the build farm. You would you would have OpenSSL there ready, and then can you would put OpenSSL into the configuration set. But what I mean, so this is more. But if you have a look here in this subdirectory of the, of the code, uh, for instance, there's uh, there's a couple of uh, modules here. File texture AFTW, uh, Redis FTW, which basically check a couple of foreign data wrappers. Uh, so um, that you know that you can you, you can certainly use it to test non-core code. Uh, you can and um, there's in fact the um, the black hole FTW is more or less done as an example. It's a, it's a uh, sort of joke I made a few years ago. Um, but it's kind of useful for building a, uh, uh, this sort of thing. Um, we, you know, we have a module for testing uh, SE Linux um, uh, that uh, that Joe runs regularly. Um, you know, uh, there's one for doing file uh, text array that I know is used a lot by some of the post GIS people. Um, so yeah, a bunch of uh, it, you can test extensions and not just core core capabilities. So if we go back to here, let's see how we're going. Still running Make. Unfortunately, the 
the cache code takes a, uh, and it works per branch. So it's um, normally that runs in in about 60 seconds when when I've done this, the cache. But with a new branch, it takes a bit longer. But anyway, if we, I'm not sure if we'll get time to have a look at that. But if 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 we don't, it will pop up on the dashboard page of that new server as a new branch. Um, then when you commit changes to that, push those changes, your Bill Farm member will, you know, you would have a cron tape job that would, would run this regularly and it will detect that there are changes, build them, push them in the, in the way that Bill Farm members normally do. So this is kind of useful. It's uh, in a bunch of different cases. It's useful for, you know, uh, corporate people uh, who want to run, um, run their own internal tests. Um, we also have a, have a use for it uh, uh, in the community for, uh, uh, for some security work. Uh, so it's useful for a variety of different purposes. Um, and it's also useful for us in, in an administrative sense because we can actually test some of the stuff that we haven't been able to test before. So, um, well, we'll wait a couple of minutes, but are there any other questions? It's a bit sad. All right, we're on to make checks, so this should happen pretty quickly now. Okay, so now if I refresh that page, and there's our new branch. So that's pretty much all working. All right. So that's all. So thank you very much for coming.